everything everyone i think we're still uh we're still seeing some folks joining in so we'll just take a few more seconds if you don't mind And I am, you know, I started with good evening, but depending on where you are, it may not be evening. It could be morning or afternoon. Um, but wherever you are, hope you are safe and hope you and your family um, are well. I'm Dr. Fanta Av, and I'm the Vice President for Undergraduate Enrollment, Campus Life and Inclusive Excellence. And it is truly wonderful to be able to spend uh, this hour with you this evening, along with uh, my colleague, Karen Casella, and some of our wonderful students who are joining us as well. Um, I've been at American University 30 years. Um, in addition to having worked at American University for 30 years, uh, it's always been in the student affairs area, so I've been working with students for 30 years. Um, I also did all three of my degrees at American University. So safe to say that American University has a very special place in my heart. It is where I found my home um, as a student. It is also where I often say I found my intellectual home. And I have found also my professional home as well. Um, and so uh, it's been a wonderful place for me. Um, and it's a place that is near and dear to my heart. I will also uh, let my colleague Karen Casella introduce herself in just a minute. Um, just to give you a brief overview of my role. Um, in my role, I am a member of the president's cabinet and I oversee our areas having to do with sort of what I call the out of classroom experience. Um, it's everything from looking at our mental health services and well-being services to having to work with our Dean of Students Office, our housing, our residence life, our Center for Diversity and Inclusion. So there's about 14 units within the Office of Campus Life uh, that are part of my portfolio. And then in addition, I oversee our undergraduate enrollment office that involves admissions as well as financial aid and our marketing team. Um, I also coordinate for the university our inclusive excellence work, which really focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I work with my colleagues across the institution, our different vice presidents, and also our provosts on our major strategic initiatives to advance a sense of belonging and also our work around inclusion and equity at the university. And I've loved every minute of the work. Um, it's been challenging on many levels, particularly during this COVID period, but there's been so many times that it's been gratifying. And frankly, what keeps me going and what has kept me for 30 years at American University is simple. It has to do with the students. Um, we have remarkable students that we get to work with on an everyday basis. And also what has kept me here has been the team, um, working with wonderful people who deeply care about the student experience and want to see students who come to American University thrive in the way in which they can. So with that, I'm going to have Karen introduce herself and then we're going to jump into our session for, to for tonight. Thank you, Fanta. Um, hello, and some of you we've already had the chance to meet virtually or in person, Karen Casella. I am a double eagle, so like Fanta, I have not one but two degrees from American University. Uh, and I worked at AU actually for a good 10 years um, right after I graduated. I took some time off because I had children of my own that I thought deserved some of my attention. And now some of you have heard this before, but I have a rising college senior and a high school senior who is about to start his college experience this fall. So I am totally right there with you families in managing this transition um, into college. And so very happy to be able to come back to AU to work professionally in this role um, alongside Fanta and so many wonderful colleagues um, here. So I hope that really comes through for you. Really tonight is about letting Fanta kind of share some of the tips and wisdom that we've gleaned working in this field in this area for so long. And then we do have time reserved at the end of tonight's session to take some questions and answers from you. I also have shared with Fanta the questions and concerns and the things that excited you that you shared with us in your, in your uh, RSVPs for this evening. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and let Fanta get us started. Our objective for this evening is really threefold. One is spend some time with you and to talk to you about how we understand the transition and growth um, that you and your students will experience during the semester. 
again, over the 30 years that I've been here, I spend a lot of time listening to what our students are telling us and sometimes what they haven't really said, but that we've seen over this period of time and also hearing from our colleagues, what's been the experience? What have we learned over this period of time? So we'll talk a little bit about that transition. What does the transition looks like? What is it gonna feel like? Um, and also what tools do we have in our toolbox? that can perhaps help us uh, during the different phases of the transition. I often remind everyone that, of course, as university uh, universities, we focus on the student transition, but we have found that families transition equally along with their students. And so we'll spend some time on that. We want to set the stage for some of the offices and departments that are represented throughout the summer orientation programs. Throughout the summer, you will uh, meet several of our colleagues. You'll talk about the services and programs that are offered. Uh, we know that that may be a lot of information, but we believe that um, the, uh, the ability to really help you size up what are the resources that are available at the institution, knowing that, yes, throughout this time, there will be some that will be more salient for you than others, uh, but we will continue through the family newsletter to keep reminding you of the resources in what I call just-in-time knowledge, and so there'll be more of that. And then to introduce you to what we call our community of care. And I'll spend some time on what is our philosophy at the university about the student experience and what is our philosophy in particular about student development. And so it is really through our community of care. And I'll talk to you about how this community of care manifests itself um, so that when you start hearing some of our terminology and yes, like many places, we have a lot of acronyms. We have a lot of terminologies. We want to make sure that we introduce you to some of our key concepts here as well. So those are really our three main objectives for this evening as we talk about the transition. Um, and really, we're excited that your students will be joining us this fall. Um, I always look forward to the time for moving because the energy is incredible. And just, I think, for those of us who are in higher education, to see our students back on campus and to just feel the energy of the place is really one of the things that I always look forward to. And so we look forward to welcoming those of you who will be able to join your students during move-in. Um, and for those families who are not gonna be able to make it to move in, please do not worry. Know that we will stay in regular touch with you through our webinars and our multiple ways of engaging you as well. We know that not everyone has the opportunity to be here in person and wanna make sure that you don't feel like you've, you've missed out on that as well. So we'll talk more about the resources that are available for families and how we're gonna communicate with you throughout. With that said, those are our three main objectives for, for, for this evening. Um, before uh, we get into our values, it was interesting for me to uh, get the list of what you're most looking forward to um, as you're thinking of sort of, you know, your student transitioning here. And I want to capture a couple of them because I think they speak volume um, about what yeah, I think we can all sort of be excited about. But also, again, with excitement comes uh, this part about some anxiety, perhaps some nervousness about how is this going to all work? So what are, what are people excited about? We heard the learning process and my students' growth. Students' ability to meet new friends, explore Washington, D.C., and learn some new things and be independent. The opportunity that AU possesses for my student becomes important. Um, having students be able to spread their wing um, and find you know, sort of their people. Um, the opportunity to take small, interesting classes with stellar faculty and meet students from all around the country and I would say from around the world. The opportunity to get involved in so many ways, both academically and co-curricular wise, uh, being in an inclusive community where, we, where they can be challenged um, and study what they're passionate about. And then knowing that AU can be that kind of supportive community that foster independent thinking um, and really allowing students to be able to soar into adulthood. Those were some of the things that you mentioned that you're excited about. And then we asked the question, what are you concerned about? And of course, of course we can anticipate that there would be concerns. Um, I would be uh, worried if there weren't any actually. Um, and among the concerns that you talked about is access to mental and academic support. Um, well, how will my student be able to overcome the anxi their anxiety? Um, how will my student handle their course load? Will my student feel at home being so far away from home? Time management skills, absolutely. Um, learning to live independently. And of course, we also know homesickness is certainly something that would be on your mind as well. And we'll have an opportunity to talk about those different things. So it was great to kind of get a sense of what's on your mind. And so we started with that. Well, 
in order for us to be able to really help students thrive at American University, we have to ground our work in our values and our value systems. And I want to talk about some of those value systems a bit, um, because I think it's important that we all start from the same place. First and foremost, the issue of integrity is really, really important to us. We often talk about that in so many ways. And through our code of conduct, we talk about the importance of integrity. Uh, it is important in community for us to know that that is core. Excellence, we believe in excellence. And we also know that excellence doesn't just come by itself. We have to set the bar. And in setting the bar, we have to provide the support that is needed. And so whether it is the faculty that we hired American University to teach our students, whether it's, it's staff who come in, and come in as professionals with not only the credentials, but we wanna make sure that staff who come and who are working in our environment care about that student experience and care about working in teams and are willing to work in a collaborative fashion. And for our students, we always say that it is about excellence first and foremost. And this piece of human dignity is really, really important. In a community as diverse as American University is, we will not always agree on many things. We do believe that in engaging in civil discourse is key and that every person deserves to have their dignity preserved. And therefore the issues around respect and human dignity is absolutely essential. A university is not just a place, it's not about buildings. It is really about the community and community has to be intentional. Every person has to play their role in wanting to be a member of the community. And it means that we all have to participate in creating a community at, at the university. Diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusive excellence are core pillar of our work. Our students come from all around the country. They have very different lived experiences. They'll come in with already shipped belief systems and values or value orientation from around the country and the world. And when we come together, the question that always comes up is, how do we engage with difference? But more importantly, how do we make sure that everyone has an opportunity to have a voice, to be seen and to be heard? And that becomes very, very important. Free inquiry and seeking truth is key. That is the essential part of what it means to get an education and especially post-secondary education. We will challenge your students all throughout, particularly around how do you know? How do you get information? How do you vet your information? Particularly at a time when there's so much misinformation, it is incredibly important. As we work with our students, we talk a lot about information literacy and we talk a lot about the importance of seeking the truth. And that's gonna be a big part of the work that our faculty will engage with our students on and that we will also engage with students on um, outside of class. At the end of the day, the work that we engage with has to be impactful. So we say to often to our students, when you come to American University, you come with your dreams, you come with your passion, you come with your talents. But what we wanna make sure is what impact do you want to have while you're here at American University, but more importantly, what impact do you want to have in your communities and in the world? And so this piece about impact is key. And we often talk about the fact that American University is really about change makers for a changing world. We know that we live in a world where there's so much that constantly is evolving, and it's incredibly important that we pre prepare our students for the world that is out there and the future uh, ahead. And so this piece about impact is important. And that takes everything from in our daily engagement with each other and also our responsibility to our adopted city, Washington, D.C., becomes an important part of this impact story for American University. Those are some of our core values and students will hear about those values throughout. Many times we'll talk about how do we show a sense of community? How do you show up in community? What does community means to you? What are you willing to invest in to forge and to sustain community? Those would be some of the conversations that we would have. So more to come there, but I thought it's important for us to start with our value systems. With that said, let's move to the next slide. For our families who are with us, 
this is just the beginning of the journey. Rest assured that we will be on this journey with you. And we have a few tips along the way that we will share. Um, I've often said that in order for the, our students to be successful, this requires a true partnership between us, the institution, and our families. And so this is really a journey, but it's more than that. It is really about forging authentic partnership with our family members throughout the time that their students will be here. And in many cases, I've remained in touch with many families over the decades, because even once the students have graduated, those relationships continue. And so it's really important to us on how we think about the exchange that we have throughout this process. And the more we can work together, the more we can ensure that the students who are here can be successful while they're here. So here are a couple of tips. Um, I often will ask our teams, what do you think is important for us to share with families? What should they know as we start down this journey? And we've collected several of them, and there are several of them that I would like to share with you. First and foremost is please read what we what we send. This may be this may seem fundamental, but we hear we get this a lot. We'll get emails that are sort of crisis emails, and we'll often hear was you know we didn't get this information or my student has told me that they haven't received any information about x y and z and our immediate answer to you will be have they checked their inbox have they checked their email did they forward their email perhaps to their gmail or a different account and then for our families as well we often will say we know that we send quite a bit of communication we really try to streamline the communication as much as possible but it is really important to read what we send because we are trying to be much more diligent about what we send and also how we're messaging because we know that all of our inboxes are full and it's hard to keep track of a lot of things. And so this piece about reading what we send is really important. And we try to do things in, in just in time fashion. We know that for example, right now during this transition period, you know, families wanting, you know, students want information about housing. So we, we will work on that. We know registration becomes a very important part of that, right? Um, so we will try to send just in time messaging um, to make sure that students can stay focused on core messages and we try to do what we can to not overwhelm, but this is also a time when there's so much coming out at, at all of us and we want to make sure that you don't miss out on anything, but please first let's start with read what we send. Second, embrace the growth opportunity and I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, I was able to pull and find out that most of you, this is not your first student who's going to college, which is wonderful, because it means that you certainly have some experience with already college age students. But here's is what I'm going to say, and I think this will not come as a surprise. Every one of your student will be different. How they respond to the college experience is not going to be the same. So it may very well be the case that this may be your second student or your third student who's going to college. But I can assure you that the experiences will be different because the time periods are different, the institutions are different, and just on a personal level, how each student is going to respond to that college experience will be quite different. But what is key is it is incredibly important to embrace the growth opportunity and there will be lots and lots of growth. We've seen that and you will experience that as well, but how we the adult adults respond to that growth. And what we signal to the students at the forefront will really tell them whether or not we trust their decisions, we trust their judgment and so forth. And I think that's going to be really, really important. Um, so it's key to make sure that, you know, we are able to signal to them that this is a normal part of what it means to be in college. And so there'll be a lot of trial and error throughout the process of college. And it's important for us to be able to be on the journey with them but embrace the growth opportunity that will be coming our way. And then next, I say this to my students all the time and students hear me and they often will chuckle because often they'll come to me and they'll say, Dr. Ab, I wanna talk to you about X, Y, and Z and I think Z should happen and so forth. And we'll have the conversation and I'll ask a lot of questions. But then the other thing I will always say back to them is, have you done your homework? So it's important to do our homework um, when we come to the table and that's an important part of the work that we all have to engage with. And sometimes doing our homework is, you know, making sure that some of the core information that's been sent, that you are versed in that, um, and that you've reached out to the right office or the appropriate person. Um, and that those things are important. 
And we want to model that for our students. I often say to students, you know, when they'll come and they'll want to talk about some things, let's talk about that. But also, let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about what have you engaged with that has provided you with some context for the information that we're about to engage with and so forth. So it's very important, this piece about doing our homework. That's another advice that our campus partners often will talk to us about. Next, assume goodwill. And this will come in handy lots and lots of times. When we're all stressed, I think we have as a default to assume not necessarily goodwill. Please, let's start from the premise that we all care about our students and we all want to see our students do well. And so part of that means let's assume goodwill of each other. Second, in assuming goodwill of each other, it becomes important to hear the other side. I often say we have one part of the story and as part of doing our homework, we need to figure out what else may be missing in this story, how incomplete is the story, and what do we need to understand? And that requires the ability to listen, and it also requires grace and giving each other the benefit of the doubt. And this is something that I, I bring up a lot because our teams will bring up, you know, I've had a call and I've gotten this and I can understand that the person was really stressed. They may have been upset. There were things that were going on that really indicated that, you know, there's some frustration. But in the, and the frustration is, is understandable. In the frustration, let us not assume that the other side either doesn't care or the other side is simply being negligent. So this assumption of goodwill is gonna become incredibly important as we move forward. Next is, let's talk about, remember, as I said, there are many sides to a story. It is important to hear all sides and suspend judgment. And what makes it challenging for us is that there'll be times when you'll reach out to us and you'll wanna talk about a situation that may be going on with your student. And we will always be there to listen. Let me start with that. We will always be there to listen. However, sometimes because of FERPA and other sort of restrictions, we may not be able to tell you pieces of the story that perhaps can provide the larger context. And we may say to you, would you mind getting a release from your student so that we can actually have that awesome, fuller conversation? And here's the thing, sometimes your students will allow that and other times they'll say, no, sorry, um, that's not possible. And if we don't have that release, then we're not gonna be able to give you, get you all of the information that can then help to sort of fill the gap. But it is important to hear the different sides of the story. Next. Now, your young adults have some advice as well. So we've given some advice from our partners, but it's important that our students also provide some advice to families because we've asked them, What's important for you? What, what is important do you think for families to understand as they're transitioning with their students? And here's a couple of what our students have said. Listen and give advice when asked. We hear this a lot. Um, and then there'll be exceptions when I'll say, listen and give advice when not ask. <laughs> and I will say, when you sort of see that danger sign or there are all of these red flags, we definitely invite you to give some, you know, some advice. It is not always the case that you, you know, our students will listen and we all know that, but that may be useful for you to give. But more often than not, students will say, listen and give advice when asked. And this has to do with the independence that many of you talked about. You're excited about them becoming in the, independent. And part of that independence is they're gonna stumble. They're gonna stumble. And in some cases they're gonna fall, but guess what? They're gonna get back up. We know that they're gonna get back up. And that becomes important. And so we learn from mistakes. Of course, we don't want those mistakes to be so dire, right? That we don't recover from it. But 99% of the time, that is not the case. And so this piece about listen and give advice is important. Next. Ah, this is an important one. Don't believe everything you read on my social media accounts. Uh, we, we often talk about this because it's no secret that 
our students as digital natives are on social media all the time. This is where students find community. This is where they seek out their information and so forth. But we also know that in this day and age, there is what I call sort of the social media persona and there's the curated self, which is not always the full self. And what do I mean by that? I will often hear from students, Dr. Av, I'm seeing all these students who seem just incredibly happy and seem to have it all together. And I feel like I'm the one who's just struggling. What's wrong with me? And often what I have to remind them is there's nothing wrong with you. Remember that on social media, there's a curated self. It doesn't mean that everybody is happy all the time, right? But that's what we may portray when we're out there. And so it becomes important. And I know for many families, you know, we often follow our students on social media and so forth, and we'll see some things posted, et cetera. And I will say, don't believe everything you read on social media accounts. And the other thing that we also talk to our students about is be careful about also sometimes what you put out on social media. It's no secret now that employers and others do go and look at social media accounts. And so think about what you're putting out there and what you're projecting. And our um, career center and others actually provide tips around social media presence and things. And so that's another important part of the education in this day and age where everything is so much more out there. And so social media is one of those pieces, those things as well. Next, just because I don't call you back right away doesn't mean that something is wrong. Don't panic. Um, I come back to this and we'll come back to this again often. Um, we'll get this frantic call from a family member. I haven't heard from my student. And I'm deeply worried and concerned about them because this is not their typical behavior. And then often myself or members of my team will ask, well, how long ago did, have you not heard from your student? And let me remind people, not hearing from your student an hour is not a crisis. Three hours does not constitute a crisis. I would even argue that even many more hours does not constitute a crisis. And this is going to happen as students become more and more adjusted to college and if they're doing what we expect them to do. Meaning you're going and having dinner with your peers you're going to the library you're attending events you're going to classes you're getting enough sleep, etc, and so forth their lives become pretty full. And yes, sometimes they may forget you know, to make that call and so forth. And so it's really important to not necessarily panic. But of course, if there's something that seems really just off, knowing your students, you know your students better than, than us, please don't hesitate to reach out and you can call our residence life team or you can call our Dean of Students office. And certainly we will follow up and find out what may be going on with the students. And nine times out of 10, we immediately are able to connect with them or like, please call home. Someone is quite worried about you, but we really will caution you about this piece of panicking because you haven't heard from your student in the moment. Again, because they're gonna have a full plate as the semester progress. Next. Please don't disappear or keep things from me. I can handle it. I bring this up because often we'll get calls from family members saying, I'm giving you a call, but please don't let my student know that I called. Or also, more importantly, I'm calling because there's something that's going on either in the family and elsewhere, and I need to talk to you about that, and I really don't want to worry my student, um, but I really ask that you not share that information with them. And what, I'm talk what I will say to you is this. More time than not, than not, students have picked up that something may be off, and they begin to also be anxious. They may not be aware of what exactly may be going on, but they become anxious. And what we often do is we'll listen and then we'll strategize with you on how might that information be shared with the student. But we do believe that it is important for us to not hide things from them because this is also what it means, what adulting means, right? We wanna make sure that we're having these candid conversation with students in the moment that makes the most sense. Of course, if there's a very serious you know, situation that's gone on at home, God forbid, maybe the passing of a family member, et cetera, we will work with you on what is the best timing to do so, but also how can we best support the student in the moment. And we've worked with enough students and families that we know what that would look like, 
But this piece about please don't disappear or keep things from me, I can handle it becomes really very important. Next. Treat us like adults, but never forget that we'll always be your children. We love you and we miss you, even if we don't tell you very often. This is quite important because um, we will hear from students and we'll hear from families, oh, they've gone to college, you know, wonder if they still remember home and et cetera and so forth. They never forget home. We can assure you of that. They never forget home. Um, the other piece that often I think comes up is that, you know, so sometimes students will put on a brave face, particularly with around homesickness and et cetera, because they don't want to maybe worry you. And other times they'll reveal what's going on with them. And what we often come back to is to say, at the end of the day, you have raised them well. Trust that. Trust your instincts around that and know that home will be home. But we also try to create a home away from home for them while they're at American University. We'll never be able to replicate what you do at home. But what we will try to do is create a sense of community and create a sense of belonging as much as we can. And next. Remember, it's a journey, and the journey looks different for different folks. There is not one right way of doing it or one wrong way of doing it. The journey will look very different for different folks. However, there are some things I can tell you for sure will happen, and I can play this scenario out, having seen it play out so many times that it's quite predictable. This is what we call the red zone. And what do we mean by the red zone in student development? It's about the first six weeks that will be the most challenging for your students. And we've seen this playbook. First is the honeymoon period. And I will actually argue that the honeymoon period has already started. For students who have finished high school, congratulations, you're done. Summer is here. And you're excited because you're now looking, your students are now looking forward to coming to college. Everything will be new, maybe different, et cetera, et cetera. They're already in the honeymoon phase. They're nervous. But for the most part, everything is on the up. And then they're going to move in, move in. You're going to feel the excitement moving into the residence hall, meeting their roommate, meeting their floor mates, getting into classes, meeting their classmates and all of that. Still the honeymoon phase, getting to know the campus, getting to know Washington, D.C., all of those pieces, honeymoon phase. And then classes begin, first assignments, they're getting used to it, etc. And then there's going to be the crunch time. Exams are due, papers are due, and they're feeling the stress is beginning to build. After the stress begins to build, reality checks comes in when they first get their, their exams back. And in many cases, your students in coming to American University, these are students who've done incredibly well in college, in, in high school. So in coming to college, college is a different thing. So we will have the student who may be earning their, a C, who may be earning a grade that they didn't expect all of a sudden their world is kind of coming down on them. And then the conflict with the roommate begins. And then homesickness settles in and everything else and so forth. And before you know it, families, you're going to be hearing from your students. I hate everything about this place. There's nothing that feels right. I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm about ready to go home, et cetera, and so forth. Nothing seems to be working at that time. We know what that phase is. And we know that that happens within the first six weeks of classes. And for our families, what we often say to you is, listen, but don't have them come home. Because the other part that makes it hard is they come home and guess what? That transition starts all over again. The cycle begins again. This is a very normal part of it. And what we do is we often will have mediation with the roommate and the students. We often will talk about, yes, we know what this phase looks like. Let's talk about that. What support structure do you need, et cetera, and so forth. And then, Social connections then become more regularized. And then after that, things begin to settle. Majority, majority of students will get over this phase. But the first six weeks are the red zone. And also during those first six weeks, there's some behaviors that will come up. And it comes up in sleeping too much because that becomes a way of escaping sort of the environmental stress, right? And in some cases, some of our students decide to self-medicate in different ways. And we have to pay attention to that, right? But again, the vast majority of students are gonna get over those six, those six weeks. 
For those who will not get over those six weeks, often what may have happened is resources would have been provided, but they have not found a way to respond to that. And that makes it incredibly challenging. And in those cases, students may wake up at the end of the semester and said, oh my goodness, you know, I may, I perhaps wasn't going to classes the way I needed to. I didn't follow up on X, Y, and Z and so forth. And then that's when the crisis sets in. So it's really important for all of us to be educated about the red zone and to be educated about what the first six weeks of classes are. One of the things that we do, and we're very intentional about that, is family weekend. We intentionally build family weekend within the first six weeks of classes because we know that it matters to students if you're able to be present to come for this period of time helps them with that reconnection that's needed and that's one of the reasons why we set up our family weekend within the first six weeks in early october period as well so we go through the honeymoon we go through the dawn period and then we come back up next campus resources and i'm not going to spend too much time on these resources because my colleagues will have spoken to you about them but we have the Dean of Students Office. That is the main office that often will take calls of concerns from community members and also from families as well. And the Dean, Dean of Students Office become that anchor. Academic Support and Access Center has a host of resources, everything from writing to tutoring to uh, somebody mentioned time management skills. Uh, they have all of those things that are available there, including disability accommodations and so forth are out of academic support. Counseling center around, uh, we have tele, telehealth, telemental health. Um, we have our psychologists who are part of the center, et cetera, and they would be able to provide with a lot of information. The student health center that is on campus as well and also does referrals as well. Um, so there will be many, many opportunities for you to engage with those stakeholders. And I know that on the 28th, several of them were also available to you during this period of time, including our student conduct and conflict resolution. And I've always said, if there's one office that your student, if they decide to never frequent, we're perfectly fine with that, is the Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution Services, right? Um, that comes up if we have folks who in many ways have breached our community standards, in which case we will have them come and we see this as an educational moment for our students. It is not punitive in the sense of punitive as much as it's incredibly important the educational moments that they need to have if there's been sort of a breach of community standards. Those are some of our campus resources uh, that are available as well. And it goes on with our first year advising, which you've, you will hear a lot about and you've already started to hear more about that. Our financial aid office, our residence life, where we have peer uh, residence hall assistants who are there as well as uh, community directors who are professionals who live within our residence hall um, and are part of our residence life team as well. And then as your students progress from the first year to the second year, they will have their second year advisors and they begin, they get introduced to their second year advisors and beyond starting in the spring semester uh, of their first year. And it is by school, it is de designated by school and they'll know who those advisors are. And I, again, let me remind you all, um, we will always listen, but we're also uh, constrained by what information we can share. If you contact us and say and ask, you know, is my student going to classes, we will not be able to answer that question. Uh, you know, so there, or, you know, what, what grades have my student gotten? Those are questions that will not be able to answer. That's information that belongs to the student. You have the ability to sign. To have, your student has the ability to sign a release that would allow you to access that information and that form is available online and you'll be able to get more information about that as well. But that's going to be important um, for you to be aware of is that the Family Educational Right and Privacy Act, we are, we are subject to that and it's important what we can share and when we can share that information. And your student, the same way your student will provide you with the release, the same way the student can take that release at any point in time. Here are a couple of things. Um, as we look toward the transition, during the time that they're, they're still at home, we really strongly advise you to have some key conversations with your students. Um, the first and most important thing is around how they think about safety. Conversation around drugs and alcohol, 
becomes really important conversations to be had. And I often hear from parents, that's not something I have to worry about with my student. And I often say to families, still have the conversation. Um, this piece around health and wellness is important. College, particularly, again, the first semester is an incredibly stressful time. Everything is new. The food is new. The sleeping habits are different. We have roommates and, you know, classes, a different schedule, different faculty members, et cetera, and so forth. So there's a lot that's going on for our students, and it's important um, for you all to be aware of those pieces and how they work. And so that's important. Karen, I'm going to have you take over some of this because I need to plug in my battery right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's quite all right. I mean, I'm glad to to step in at this key conversation. Svanta has mentioned a couple of key points. And one thing I'd like to just pause and, and comment is families, not only am I with your students at like New Eagle Day and orientation, but I frankly, one of my favorite duties as an AU employee is to help out at commencement. And so what I want to share is like, regardless of what your students tell you in the first couple of weeks, like every year we are graduating a class of thousands of students who have happily found their home here at AU. So this like red zone is real, but they come out of it and they come out successful with great friends and great futures. And so let's keep that in mind. Um, I'm so glad that I was noting a couple of the questions that were coming up in chat. So folks were asking about HIPAA and some of these um, confidentiality things. I think what's super important for me to share with families now while I've got your attention is we don't have a blanket release form. There is no single form. And in fact, very deliberately, there are no forms for parents to access a, to, to ask your student to give you a release. The students have to do this, right? So when we talk about these key conversations, one of the critical things for you this summer is to really talk with your students about your expectations for what they will share with you. What is most important? What is timely for you? Um, some of you may be starting to experience this as your students are dealing with their adolescent healthcare appointments over the course of the summer. But the way our health center works is kind of like your student's um, primary care facility where it's like the doctor, but our physicians won't be able to speak with you unless your student has granted permission for each specific encounter. So this is really a good time for you to coach your student. I fully expect you to share with me about this, 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 or it's okay if I don't know about X, Y, Z, but you need to have that conversation with your student. And similarly, you'll find that many of our offices, we are all always going to be happy to talk with you about what the general policies and procedures are. But it is up to your student to give us permission to speak with you about specific details about your student's record. So you'll see with the student bill, they're going to give you access to view and pay their bill. They can also take that away. And when it comes to like their grades or how they're doing with a class or their academic advising, you need to have that conversation with your student to say, hey, can you give me permission to speak with your advisor? But what I frankly often uh, propose to families is let your student book the appointment. Most of our advisors are actually offering online appointments now. And just suggest to your student, hey, if you would like me to join you, just let me know. Then you can all be on the same page and you're still letting your student be the driver, but they know that you're right there in case they forgot what questions they should be asking. Um, when we get to this like family communication, Fonta had mentioned earlier, you know, this notion about like, don't freak out if your student doesn't call you back right away. And I know for some of you, that's going to feel like silly and ridiculous. Like, why are they even telling us this? But families, I'll tell you, I have responded to well over 3000 family emails in the last couple of years. And sometimes some of you will forget that we've had this conversation mm -hmm. yeah. and you'll freak out a little bit because you haven't heard from your student. Um, and normally it's because they're having normal college fun time. Uh, peers of mine in this room, when we were in college, remember we had to use a pay phone down the hall or we had to have an actual phone in our room with an actual tape for, for recording messages, right? We didn't have cell phones. We couldn't, our parents couldn't reach us 24 seven. So let's adjust the expectations here a little bit. Sometimes you're not hearing back because they're just doing all the student things like they're in class or they're hanging out with friends or they're out getting pizza or they're sitting out having a lofty discussion on the quad. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're in danger, right? 
And so what I recommend to families very honestly is talk with your student about those expectations for how you will communicate. Some families that means setting a weekly check-in call. For others, it may say, hey, uh, I know I've got orientation leaders on here and stuff. Isabel, Isabel, tell me your, your roommate's number. So if I can't reach you and I'm worried, I can text your roommate and make sure you're okay, right? But let's not expect our resident uh, uh, assistants, right, in the, in the residence halls to play that role. The resident assistants are students just like your own. And we're not going to ask them to be babysitters. They're there as a resource, but they're really not a great, um, we don't want to give them the responsibility of having to do welfare checks for your students. That's not their role. So again, having expectations, setting conversations with your students right now will help save you some panic later. <laughs> Jennifer, I see your comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Know, you. College, yes. college in the 80s was like a totally, totally yes. different thing, yes. right? And, we'll and I'm so glad that, that Fanta mentioned early those expectations. What I loved seeing from the comments that you all shared with us about what you're looking forward to for your students, how many of you were looking forward to seeing what happens when your student gets to share their independence or like explore with it, because that's what they told us to, right? Um, so keeping that in mind, I also love to stress to families, uh, you know, Fanta is a triple eagle, I'm a double eagle. We've spent decades between us here at AU I know that some of this feels a little scary because your student isn't under your roof. And especially after COVID, we're very used to them being under our roof. But you're sending your student to a campus, an entire community where all of us here know that your students are gonna make mistakes. They're gonna miss deadlines. They're gonna be late. They're gonna be silly. They're 19, they're 20. Like, but the entire this entire institution recognizes what it means to work with young adults who are still figuring things out. And there's really very few other instances in their life where they're gonna have this kind of support system here. So we'll work together. And I'm gonna ask families that like, when you start feeling anxious, I want you to email me. And I'm gonna say, Isabel, can you put the AU parents at American.edu, or sorry, it's AU parent, singular, AU parent at American.edu email in the chat. And when, when you wanna reach out and, and like call an office, just call my office and I will help connect you appropriately or support your student. Um, thank you, Isabel. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead here. Let's see if I can. All right. So community of care. So Fonta will speak to this and you'll hear some of our other staff, but we really do do a lot of work to make sure we've got some wraparound services to support your student. And we're doing it in a developmental way, right? Because we know that your students have to learn. And sometimes that means learning from mistakes. Um, we're going to try to make sure that we've got the safety net in place so the mistakes and the consequences are not so dire, but sometimes as we learn to be an adult, that means we also have to learn what our consequences are. Yeah, no, thank you, Karen. Go and, ahead, Fonta, jump on in. No, no, thank you. And I think going back to sort of what Karen talked about, the safety net is really to think about what is the wraparound support um, that students can benefit from. So for us, we have uh, the, the starting point is we often say it takes a village and it truly does take a village. And in this case, the community of care, the guardrails are first our housing and residence life. Is student not, are we noticing a student who's not coming out of their room a lot? Are we noticing a student perhaps who's not um, engaging as much with their peers, et cetera, and so forth? Um, keeping in mind that that doesn't always mean that there is a problem, right? Because again, some of us are much more introvert than others. Not everybody is rah-rah, and that's okay. That is perfectly fine. It's important for us to remember that. But we wanna be looking for patterns and wanna see what's maybe going on. So that's some of it. Or maybe the person in the residence life may hear from a roommate who has expressed some concern about their roommate um, or floor mate, et cetera. So we start there and the residence hall assistant will then you know, begin to have the conversation with the student to see what's going on. Then the first year advising. Every student has a first year advisor. In addition to having a first year advisor, the student will be taking a class with the first year advisor. And this allows the first year advisor to, to, have, to engage with students as advisors and also as instructor for AUX, the AUX one um, course. So the first year advisor may be the person who then in their uh, exchange with student finds out that maybe this student is struggling with maybe some with their courses or maybe struggling with kind of getting connected and so forth. 
that becomes another avenue for us to know what may be going on with the student. And they will def generally provide the student with resources on how they can reconnect. That may be how this would work. Then we get the early warning reports. What is early warning report? It is the fact that a student may not be going to classes or they've missed a major exam in a course. In this instance, the faculty will submit an early warning. And that is to indicate they would generally connect, connect with the student and say, hey, I'm concerned because I've noticed that you've missed X number of classes. I've noticed perhaps that you haven't turned in your exam, what's happening, et cetera. In addition, that early warning report would go to the first year advisor and the dean of students office would have access to that. This would not necessarily mean that that student will be automatically contacted by the dean of students office if it's one early warning. But if we see that there's two or three, then that may lead to the advisor and others saying, hey, I need for you to make an appointment and to come and see me. Now, let me be clear. We will reach out and folks will do what they can, but we cannot force students to show up. And I know sometimes this is hard for parents because some of you will say, well, has someone followed up with them? And if they haven't shown up, what are you going to do about that? Again, adulting. This is an important part of adulthood, right? The outreach will be done. The, you know, we'll try to facilitate as much as we can, but we can't force the student to show up. And so that's an important part of this. The care report. The care report is in the Dean of Students office. Any person within our community, whether it's a faculty member, a staff member, a peer, who may have concern about a member of the community can put in a care report. And in putting the care report, it signals to the Dean of Students Office that outreach may be needed. And that is an important part of a community of care. It's important that we watch out for each other. It's important that we be there for each other and that we do the outreach when we see that perhaps there may be something going on and trying to do that outreach early enough in the process so that the appropriate intervention can happen. And this may mean that as a result of it, the student may be referred to an academic coach, right? And the academic coach will meet with the student. It may mean that the student then is referred to the counseling center so that they can meet with a counselor in the counseling center or refer to the student health center, et cetera. Those will be things that will be done. And this goes back to what I said, let's assume goodwill. When something happens with your student, do not assume that no action has been taken. The question is, has the student taken us up on the proposal for referral, the invitation to come and meet with someone, the invitation to set up an appointment and so forth? That becomes very important. And it is the case that sometimes, and this is part of what it means to be independent. Sometimes students will say, you know what? I want to figure this out on my, on my own. I want to do this on my own. And there's nothing wrong with trying to figure it out on your own, right? But what I often say to students is, once you've tried that and you've tried other strategies, if it still doesn't work, it's important to try something else, right? And it is okay to seek help. It's not a weakness. Every one of us sometimes can use a little bit of help. And so it'll be important for you to please stress that to your students and to encourage them that when they do get an invitation for an appointment or they've gotten a referral to at least give it a try. So that's part of our community of care that we will, you will often will hear about. Again, for our families, this is about a partnership. You know a lot about your student in coming to American University. We know a lot about students once they're here and what the transition will, will look like. And so it's really important that we work in partnership. And part of that means reaching out. Part of it means also letting go, really letting go and trusting the process. And so with that, um, we, we heard what some of what you're excited about. So are we. We are excited for your students. We're excited for the learning opportunity, um, the community that they'll be able to engage with. 
we do look very much forward to those things. Um, so that's important. But we also know that, again, with that transition comes a lot of anxiety. And that's a very normal part of the process as well. Um, with that said, did we post the information about the parent, the family? Yes. Yeah, the contact. That's important because you'll be getting the newsletters from us. You'll get webinars. Again, we're going to be doing just in time webinars with you throughout this process. We look forward to those of you who can attend family, uh, the family weekend. We look forward to having you join us for family weekend as well. That'll be in early October. With that, some questions, and I know um, our students have been quite busy. Uh, thank you to all of our orientation leaders for answering many of the questions in the chat. I would chime in to say, I know I see some late questions about, you know, move in and what to expect families. Yes. We're going to have a whole webinar just about move in and just about what you can expect. But I will say this as for advice. I recommend that parents remember, keep your visits with your students kind of brief. I know that sounds a little harsh, but I mean it because um, you'll want to help your student unpack and decorate, but really they're gonna share their room with somebody else. Let the students make choices about where things go together. That will be an important bonding opportunity. So moms, help your student make the bed. That's totally fine. And when you're here for move in, Fanta and I will invite you to join us for complimentary coffee, tea, and yes, tissues. Yes, the tissues the bridge, will be coming out. We always have our Kleenex box with us. In the Bridge Cafe, yes. we'll be yes. there for you when your student is like throwing some shade your way. Some of you may have heard the like this adage about your student like kind of dirtying the nest before they head off to college. It's pretty true. So you should also expect at home before your student even gets here that they may be pushing boundaries. They're working through what it means for them to leave the same way you're kind of working through what it means for them to be gone. And it's it hits everybody in unexpected ways. And I'm about to start crying because I have a student of my own heading off who I'm starting to pack for already. So I totally get you. Um, but we do, but we do think that it's helpful to keep your goodbyes kind of concise because we're going to wrap your student up into all kinds of activities and you don't want to set them up to make hard choices about should I stay with my mom or should I go where all these new students are going. Fanta, sounds like you were going to chime in. Yeah, no, there was a couple of folks who were writing in the chat about the family weekend and the days not being correct. It is October the 7th through the 8th, so I'm not sure, or 7th through 9th, so I'm Nine, not sure yeah. where it's posted wrong, but I would love to hear where so we can fix that. Thank you. Yeah. It's wrong on the slides that are currently oh, showing. Wrong. I'm okay. so sorry. You know why? Because these are last, I'm sorry, they're last year's slides. Totally my bad. Thank you for that. I Thank you. I will adjust that. I'm so sorry. Thank you. It's 7 to 9. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, other comments? Uh, what is Explore DC? Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> it was a question. Yeah, no, Explore DC is a chance for students who want to come in a little early. It's really best designed for students who want to go out and explore DC through community service and sort of social justice lens. So there's uh, opportunities for up to 200 students. There's a website, it's Ose Explore DC. They've also set up for your students to explore them in the Engage app where your students should already be. And they can also reach out to us at orientation at american.edu for information. They'd come in a little early and they'd spend their days going out in the city in groups. So it's really great um, for students who wanna fully participate. Um, if your student is ambiguous, this is not the program for them. Melissa was asking about the academic calendar year for 2022-23. Fanta, I believe it from an academic perspective, it's final, right? So in terms of when classes start and the periods for um, exams and yeah. holiday breaks, those are all set, right? They are. They are set. What, what I like to caution to families is please do not make non-refundable travel plans until your student has reviewed their syllabus. Please, right? yes. And oftentimes your student may also get so caught up and excited and committed with their activities or their internships or their jobs. And they may forget to tell you that they actually work until Friday and you're trying to get them on a plane on Wednesday. So please just communicate with your student about those expectations. It'll save you both a lot of grief. There's questions about bed loft rentals. 
Your student can find out all that information about things like micro fridges and lofts and the size of their beds, which is a standard twin, by the way, on the housing website. Yeah, and the question about Thanksgiving, that is correct. Um, Thanksgiving is from the Wednesday on uh, through the weekend. Yeah. Yep. It says, I looked at the Christmas break schedule and the school start up late in January. It should be on the calendar. We normally start right before um, MLK, um, MLK day. So depending on um, what time that is, it may be in that phase, but it is on the calendar, the academic calendar. Yeah. See, Elizabeth was asking about the extra long beds. We have a, a limited number of those. And so we ask the, for some documentation to de demonstrate that your student really does need an extra long bed. So like a five foot four, like me, wouldn't get one, but your six foot five student would. Um, so just hold tight, but the housing team will be able to answer that for your student. This was a great question. Um, you know, you talked about the red zone. My child was planning to come home for family weekend. Would you recommend against that? You know, I don't necessarily recommend against that um, if it's for, you know, a short weekend. I just caution that, you know, when that, that the first impulse not be that, right? When your student begins to talk about the challenges that they're having, we want you to work with them on, let's figure this out. Let's figure out some parts of this because there is that transition phase that you would like for them to come for, you know, um, a long weekend. That's fine. Uh, but know that depending on when that time period is, it's important to first work out some of these issues because in coming back, those issues will still be here for a period of time. And it's important for us to help normalize that for our students. I'll also add just as a student, family weekend is truly a weekend. It is Saturday and Sunday. Students still have classes that Friday and that Monday. Um, so if your students going out of town, they're probably gonna have to leave Friday night and come back Sunday night. So just like re realize like that it's a weekend. It's not like family vacation week. Yeah. Yes. And I, and thank you for, for reminding of people of that, Isabel, because if they're going to take a weekend, it would be that October break, which is that Friday. And that is different from a uh, family weekend. And so that's an important piece of do not assume that because it's family weekend, that classes are not held on Friday if students have classes. Right. And I do get questions every year from families about fall break. It really is just the one day. Yeah. So for most students, like the, the stress about traveling, for just that period of time will kind of undermine the intent of the break, which is to take a pause and make sure you can catch up on all the, the midterm studying and the big projects that you've got. So I, I families, I would not advise that you look at that as a chance to connect with your student. I think let them focus on what they need to do to just rest and get ready for the, the next stretch. And this, there was a question also about the meal plan. And mm -hmm. I believe, Karen, we're going to be having a session specifically around the meal plan, right? Dining and meal plan. Yeah, I think we are going to. But, uh, you know, all first year students living in the residence halls are automatically assigned up for the minimum plan, which is 175 plan meal block. For most students, that's enough. The option that you have for your student who lives in the hall is to increase it, not to decrease it. They can increase to an all access plan. Somebody had also asked how much is it for additional swipes? We don't pay per swipe, but there are opportunities like some of our dining options on campus where they can use their meal plan include Subway or Einstein Brothers Bagels or Starbucks. And they can certainly still pay with their Eagle Bucks or with cash for those a la carte items that they might need. But we'll talk through. And our orientation leaders, Isabel and my, my the rest of my team here, will definitely give your students like the real deal on what they should expect from dining. And yeah, so I just did want to plug, there's been a lot of questions that like, if you have not already, please sign up for our our, our New Eagle Essentials webinars. Um, we held yes. one this past um, week. There will be two more. Um, all the information is on our Facebook pages. They're for families and students. For students, it's mandatory to attend. Um, we'll be talking about everything from dining to housing to safety on campus to joining clubs. Anything you want to know, we'll address. Um, thank you for suggesting yeah please attend our webinars we love hosting them karen will also be there um 
we address everything. I also do want to plug our family Zoom rooms that we'll be having. Um, so we'll be or orientation leaders will be addressing questions in those family Zoom rooms as well, and the information is on our Facebook. And there's a couple of things. The bills are have not gone out. They're going out next week. So the student bills are going out next week. That question has come up. Um, and so know that that's, that'll be coming. The other uh, question that was asked is with the, uh, with the essentials, with the Eagle essentials, is one enough or should they go to many? That was one of the questions that came up. So the new Eagle essentials are designed to give you kind of a quick overview in a three hour period of time so that if you miss other dates and opportunities all summer, you can capture most of it in those new Eagle, new Eagle essentials. Families, my email at auparentandamerican.edu, we can help make sure that you're getting the emails you should be getting. But if you're here tonight, I think you're getting the right emails, right? So, so don't stress about it. Um, we're going to continue our outreach and sometimes our systems take a little bit of time, but we're here to help you make sure that you've got what you need. Yes, we do record our webinars. We'll share out to you how you can access the whole library of our orientation webinars as we build them. So just give us a minute. We've got a caption and get them ready and then we'll post and share them out to you. Um, there was one thing that I just wanted to state, and this is really important again. Um, you know, some were asking, well, should I have my own fridge or my own in my own microwave, et cetera, so forth. The most important thing you can do, actually starting as soon as you can, is encouraging your student to begin dialogue with their roommate. The who brings a fridge, who gets this and that, it's really important. Given that this is, they're going to be sharing space. It is really important that they engage with each other around what are some of the things that we're going to need in the room? Who's going to do what and so forth? I think that's important that those conversations begin. And I think what you can do as families is help your students on how you frame those discussions, but encourage the, the dialogue. It cannot happen too soon. Someone was asking the question of finalizing registration before billing need to drop one class. As you add and drop, it will continue. Um, you know, as you drop one class and you add another, keeping in mind that I think is what, up to 17 and a half credits here is the same amount. So really adding and dropping will not necessarily shift the bill for full-time students. Any other questions? And I'm looking at the chat here. Um, any other that we're missing at this point? Shelly was asking about roommate assignments. Your students should already have their roommate assignment, but yes. what you should expect today is the move-in date and time. But really, your students are going to be the ones who can go into the portal and find out about their roommate assignments. And families, like, just keep in mind, the student is the only one who can make decisions or changes about their room or their roommate. So you can't. So this is a chance for you to coach your student and help them, like, figure out how do you frame the email when you've got this question and you're not sure how to ask it. Just go ahead. They've got the tools. It's in, the, in their portal. And they've got students like Isabel and Malia and the rest of my team who, who they, if they, they can do it, it means your student can do it too. So they've totally got you covered. Yeah, the information was sent out about moving date. Not that they have necessarily selected it, but how to go about that. And that was just sent out this, this afternoon. So. Yeah, yeah. So the students get their moving date, but parents like, um, they should also be receiving information. If the, the date that we assign your student doesn't work so well for your family, maybe you've got another student to move in at another school or you've got some work conflicts, your student will also get instructions about how they can change their move-in date and time, but let your student do it. Just encourage them to go back and reread their email and you can read it with them, but they've got what they need, they need to help nail down those move-in dates for you. So like Christopher, yep, your student will get instructions about how they can request an earlier move-in date if that's what your family needs. Just have them read their emails. Um, folks, it says, thank you so much for hanging out with us and thank you, Fanta. Did you have any closing remarks? You said the link didn't work in moving date email. So maybe Karen, that's something we can circle back on. Sure, we can totally go back. Um, it's also in the student's housing portal. So portal. that might be part of it. Like a parent, you can't access your student no. portal. 
only your student can access the portal. So sometimes that causes some of the confusion. And of course, housing is always available at housing at American.edu. And if they're not readily available to answer your email, there'll be an auto reply with a link for their live chat feature as well. So they have a lot of great customer service housing at American.edu, but it's always gonna be best for your student to do it because they can give your student an immediate answer. Without their student's permission, they can only tell you like the process, right? So help your student to do that work for themselves. Um, unique, I see you asking about the Facebook group. You see our logo right here on the screen, the AU Parents. When you see that, you're at the official AU Parent Facebook group and we don't restrict our membership. So you can just sign up and join and follow us. Um, that family Facebook group is for all of our families, not just our first year families. So we don't post everything for first year families there. Just send us an email to orientation at American or to AU parents at American. And, and lastly, let me just say again, thank you um, to all of our Eagle families. Uh, welcome to American University. We look forward to meeting you. Um, we look forward to having your student at AU. And I think you've heard the recurrent theme um, this evening, you're going to hear this from my colleagues and the team. It is going to be how do we work with you in partnership? And then also, how do we work together to help folks let go? Um, and so with that, um, wishing all of you the best as we make our way through the summer. Before we know it, August will be upon us um, and we will be seeing many on campus as we get through our moving period and to our orientation leaders who are with us this evening thank you for spending some time with us and i think for our families it goes without saying there are wealth of information and resource here you've just gotten a taste of it um, and over the next several weeks your students will have the great um, fortune of spending some time with our orientation leaders where they can really learn more about american university and make some important connections um, as they begin their journey here with us um, if unless there's anything else, we're going to call it an evening. Um, and thanks, everyone. Please. I just want to say I'm seeing all these thank yous. But, you know, again, families, yes. we thank you for taking this time to invest in your students' success. We're here with you. Thank you again and good night. And wishing everyone well. Take care.